my favorite subjects, and that is uh, the wonderful opportunity we have to receive revelation in the church. I was one of those who casually participated in one of the most significant acts of common consent of my generation. Maybe you were too. I excuse my lack of understanding because I was young when in April of 1976, the General Conference, I sustained and approved the actions of the First Presidency and Council of the Twelve in adding two new sections to the Pearl of Great Price, formally enlarging the official body of the standard works of the Church. Though Elder Boyd K. Packer of the Quorum of the Twelve called it a day of great events relating to the scriptures, my reaction to the addition of scriptures was nonchalant. Oh, Carrie? How come we don't? Oh, how come it doesn't go on the screen? This is typical of my life with technology. I say the adversary is in technology, <laughs> and he seems to constantly go after me. But you can see I'm used to it. I remain very calm. Ah. Nothing? It was a great PowerPoint. It's on here. Well, now you've taken off the other. <laughs> well, we'll just go ahead and hope that uh, we can overcome. I was surprised, and I think all of the brethren were surprised at how casually that announcement of two additions to the standard work was received by the church. But President Packer said, we will live to sense the significance of it. Someday, we will tell our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren about the wonderful opportunity we had to... <laughs> The wonderful uh, opportunity that we had to, through common consent, make those two revelations part of our standard works. And President Packer said we were recorded in our diaries that we were on the earth and we remember when that took place. My paper will seek to attach the proper significance to the inclusion of Joseph S. Smith's vision of the redemption of the dead in the standard works. Today, more is known about how this scriptural passage came to be than what is known about probably any other section found in the Doctrine and Covenants. Most Latter-day Saints are aware of the events surrounding President Joseph F. Smith when he received this revelation. During his final illness in October 1918, President Smith was stricken by age and was undoubtedly pondering the recent death of his son and other family members. With his own looming death, which took place a few weeks after, he may have been pondering about the nature of his own future ministry in the spirit world. There has been some research about the global and personal context surrounding Joseph S. Smith's vision. LDS scholars Richard E. Bennett, George S. Tate, and others have described the context in which the revelation received, citing the influence of the Great War, the 1918 influenza pandemic, and President Joseph F. Smith's personal experiences with death that brought him to ponder that significant passage of Second Peter. While the vision proceeds from and affirms the great love of God, the timing of when the vision became canonized scripture also clarifies and reiterates the great love God has for his children, most especially the love he has for his valiant and obedient children who are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints those who shoulder the responsibility of performing ordinances for the dead. The text of Joseph S. Smith's vision of the redemption of the dead sets forth with remarkable clarity the manner in which the Savior declared liberty to the captives 
before his resurrection. It also discloses the pattern by which the doctrines of the gospel become known to those who have died without that knowledge. The vision itself, as you know, answers many questions that perplex not only LDS communities, but the entire Christian world. Much has been done to help us understand the difficult theological questions which Joseph F. Smith's vision of the redemption of the dead answers, such as what becomes of those who die without the opportunity to accept Christ while they lived, or a particular interest to us as Latter-day Saints, is the message of how the gospel comes to the dead and how the gospel is taught in the spirit world. Many religious scholars have made serious effort at analyzing and expanding on the vision's text, which answers those questions. The vision of the redemption of the dead went through the incubation period until it became a formal part of the Pro Great Prize. Thereafter, the vision was included in the Doctrine and Covenants. Church members had to mature in certain doctrines about work involving the spirit world before they comprehended the phenomenon associated with the doctrine given in Joseph F. Smith's vision. I need you to slow down. <laughs> Thanks. Have I got anything? Oh, boy. Well, okay. Yeah, back up for me. <laughs> Once the doctrine and the vision was made known more widely through general conference addresses, the revelation was then taught, accepted, and ultimately applied by church membership. Once Latter-day Saints could live by its teachings because of the introduction of technology, this revelation was canonized as part of the standard works. The research provided in this paper is a thorough study of the historical process that brought this doctrinal statement out of obscurity and into the realms of modern Mormon scripture. This study centers on the use of the vision by general authorities and general conference, exploring who quoted the text, the context of the use, and the interpretation of doctrinal insights that they shared. Section 138 of the Doctrine and Covenants now serves as one of the foundational documents for the current practices and doctrines of the Temple Ordinances for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. With this in mind, it is important to understand the process that took place from the announcement of the vision in 1918 to the canonization in 1976, and the use of the canonized version by general authorities as part of the standard works thereafter. I will explore the factors that led to the ultimate canonization and will hypothesize why 1976 became the watershed year for the vision to become scripture, making this revelation scripture before this time would have caused great hardship on us as Latter-day Saints. Why? Because we lack the technology and the ability to accomplish the necessary family history work to make ordinances possible on a larger scale. Joseph F. Smith never shared his vision nor described it in general conference of what he had seen. In October 1918, most Latter-day Saints did not expect to see their prophet at general conference since he had been undergoing a siege of very serious illness for the last five months. At the time, Joseph F. Smith was too ill to speak very long. However, it appears that President Smith had every intention of sharing his vision at a future time when he was more capable of standing before a congregation, he said, quote, I shall postpone until some future time, the Lord being willing, my attempt to tell you some of the things that are in my mind and that dwell in my heart. I have not lived alone these last five months. I have dwelt in the spirit of prayer, of supplication, of faith, and of determination, and I have had my communication with the spirit of the Lord continuously. End of quote. President Joseph S. Smith's entire address may have lasted a total of five minutes, and the statement I just read was all that he said to the congregation regarding the future new scripture. According to President Smith's son, Joseph Fielding Smith, the prophet expressed the fact that during the past half year, he had been the recipient of numerous manifestations, some of which he had shared with his son both before and following the conference. At the close of the October 1918 conference, the prophet then dictated the vision of the redemption of the dead to his son, Joseph Fielding Smith. On October 31st, 1918, 
The dictated manuscript was presented to the First Presidency, the Quorum of the Twelve, and the Church Patriarch in a council meeting. At the time, the prophet was too ill to attend, so he asked his son, Joseph Fielding, to read the revelation to the gathering. President Anthony H. Lund recorded in his journal, quote, In our council, Joseph F. Smith, Jr. read a revelation which his father had had in which he saw the spirits in paradise. And he also saw that Jesus organized a number of brethren to go and preach to the spirits in prison, but did not go himself. It was an interesting document, and the apostles accepted it as true and from God. James E. Talmadge also wrote about the event in his journal, quote, Attended meeting of the First Presidency in the Twelve today. President Smith, who is still confined to his home by illness, sent to the brethren the account of a vision through which, as he states, revealed to him important facts relating to the work of the disembodied Savior in the realm of departed spirits and of the missionary work in progress on the other side of the veil. By united action, the Council of the Twelve, with the Council of the First Presidency and the Patriarch, accepted and endorsed the revelation as the word of God. President Smith's signed statement will be published in the next issue of the Improvement Era, which is the organ of the priesthood quorums of the church. The text of the vision, now watch this, then appeared in the November 30th edition of the Deseret Evening News. It was also printed in the December Improvement Era in the January 1919 editions of the Relief Society magazine, the Utah Geological Historical Magazine, the Young Women Journal, and the Millennial Star. General authorities seemed anxious for the saints to have access to the text of the vision in a timely manner. President Smith's physical condition worsened, and on November 19th, three weeks after conference, he died of pneumonia. In his funeral address for President Joseph F. Smith, James E. Talmadge mentioned the vision. He reminded the audience, President Smith was permitted shortly before his passing to have a glimpse into the hereafter and to learn where he would soon be at work. He was a preacher of righteousness on the earth. He is a preacher of righteousness today. He was a missionary from his boyhood up, and he is a missionary today amongst those who have not yet heard the gospel, though they have passed from mortality into the spirit world. I cannot conceive of him as otherwise than busily engaged in the work of the master. With such importance being placed on the vision during the last few weeks of Joseph S. Smith's life and at his funeral, you have to wonder why the vision drifted into obscurity over the next 27 years. There is no documentation of any church leader discussing or teaching elements of the vision in general conference and nothing happened with it until 1945. You have to ask yourself, why did contemporaries of Joseph F. Smith, those closest to him who sat in a council room and declared the revelation to be the word of God, didn't speak of it in general conference? There must have been a reason for that neglect. Even the prophet's own son, Joseph Fielding Smith, did not as a general authority ever use the vision in his sermons though he included it in his father's biography, which he published in 1938, and also in a volume of gospel doctrine, nothing. James E. Talmadge, likewise, did not discuss it in front of the church congregations at General Conference. It's interesting to note that a few weeks before Joseph F. Smith's announcement that he had had a vision, James E. Talmadge had given a talk in the tabernacle where he said, quote, the purpose is that of promoting among the members of the church a vital active interest in the compilation of genealogical records and the collating of times of lineage and in the formation of true family pedigrees so that the relationship between ancestry and posterity may be determined and be made readily accessible. It is a notable fact that in the last seven or eight decades we have witnessed a development in the interest of genealogical matters theretofore unknown in modern times and influence operative in the world, a spirit moving upon the people in response to which the people are yearningly reaching backward to learn of their dead, end of quote. And yet, after a prophet of God receives a revelation just a few weeks later which detailed the activities in the spirit world, James E. Talmadge never mentioned the vision in general conference. The contemporaries of Joseph F. Smith simply did not refer back to the vision of the redemption of the dead after his death. 
during Heber J. Grant's administration, other pressing issues, such as prohibition, the Great Depression, World War II, <laughs> dominated the lives of Latter-day Saints and the teachings of their leaders. However, though World War II would take millions of lives, general authorities said nothing about this revelation, which clearly outlines what would happen to those victims of war. It's not until after the war, in April of 1945, that presiding bishop Joseph L. Worthlin mentioned President Joseph S. Smith and his experience of being caught up by the spirit and permitted to see what was going on in the spirit world. Bishop Worthlin used the vision to challenge the teachings of a Cardinal Gibbons, a leading ecclesiastical leader of the day. Cardinal <laughs> Gibbons had said, that the ordinance of baptism was changed from that of immersion to sprinkling for convenience sake. Bishop Worthland used the vision to refute that premise and answered the question, quote, what would happen to those not born of the water and the spirit? Bishop Worthland also emphasized that the vision of the redemption of the dead showed the great kindness of a father in heaven who instituted a plan by where all his children, whether dead or alive, might have a chance to accept or reject the gospel. This emphasis on the kindness of God was the first time the vision of the redemption of the dead had been used as a metaphor. It would be another 19 years before the vision of the redemption of the dead was again even mentioned during general conference. In April 1964, Elder Marion G. Romney simply said, quote, Another medium of revelation is visions. You know about Nephi's vision, the prophet's great vision recorded in the 76th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, and President Joseph S. Smith's vision of the work for the dead in the spirit world. Isn't it interesting that Elder Romney said to the congregation when referring to the vision, you know about it, though it had not been spoken of in general conference for nearly two decades. Two years later, in 1966, Elder Spencer W. Kimball spoke of continuing revelation and merely said, the visions of Wilford Woodruff and Joseph F. Smith would certainly be on par with the visions of Peter and Paul. Elder Kimball then declared that the vision of the redemption of the dead was, quote, the most comprehensive example of continuous revelation available to Latter-day Saints. In these three addresses, the vision is mentioned, but there's no use of the text of the revelation itself, there's no connection made by general authorities of the vision's doctrines to the lives of Latter-day Saints. Just six months before canonization, Elder Boyd K. Packer made an interesting introduction to his general conference address. He said, I have reason, my brothers and sisters, to feel very deeply about the subject that I have chosen for today and to feel more than the usual need for your sustaining prayers because of its very sacred nature, end of quote. One of the subjects Elder Packer felt so strongly about was the vision of the redemption of the dead. For the first time in a general conference, a general authority quoted directly from the vision. It had been 57 years since the vision had been acknowledged to be the word of God, yet this was the first time the text was shared in conference. This was also to be the first time that the vision would be linked to genealogical research. After quoting two verses from the future scripture, Elder Packer stated, quote, Here and now then, we move to accomplish the work to which we are assigned. We gather records of our kindred dead, indeed the records of the entire human family, and in sacred temples and baptismal fonts, designed as those were anciently, we perform those sacred ordinances, end of quote. Elder Packer may have sensed that the vision would soon become LDS scripture. Latter-day Saints are being taught that the only way spirits can be released from bondage is through temple ordinances, which can only be done after geological research is conducted. Joseph Fielding McConkie, my former colleague, believes that his father, Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve, was instrumental in bringing the subject up with the First Presidency. Joseph Fielding McConkie tells us, that his father heavily drew upon the vision when he wrote his six-volume series on the Messiah. Quote, because of his position, Elder McConkie's, on the Scripture Publication Committee and his love of the revelations of the Restoration, 
Elder McConkie was in a position to recommend that Joseph Smith's vision of the celestial kingdom and Joseph F. Smith's vision of the redemption of the dead be added to the canon of scripture. At the time, Elder McConkie had also desired to add other historical manuscripts to the canon, including, watch this, the Wentworth letter, the lectures on faith back in, the doctrinal exposition of the First Presidency on the Father and Son issued in 1916, the King Follett Discourse and the similar discourse given by the Prophet Joseph in the Grove at Nauvoo in June of 1844. The fact that the vision of the redemption of the dead and Joseph Smith's vision of the celestial kingdom were the two documents that became scripture while the other manuscripts were not gives those two even more significance in the importance of Latter-day Saint doctrine. Additionally, President Kimball's son, Edward, also discloses that his dad had long wished for official recognition of those two revelations dealing with the fate of the dead because of the added significance to genealogical work. There is no doubt that President Kimball, as the prophet, acted upon the urgency he felt that these two visions be included in the standard works. There was also non-church stimuli at the time that surrounded the concept of life after death. You'll remember Alex Haley's book on roots, published in 1975, and then the dramatization of one of the first TV miniseries. In January of 1977, there was great interest in family history nationally. There was what was called by the media a genealogy mania sweeping the nation, and the church certainly had enhanced the reason that this surge of genealogy was taking place. Bicentennial celebrations in 1976, where many local histories appeared and there was abundance of national pride, may have also primed the acceptance of this vision of scripture. At the April 1976 General Conference, President Nathan Eldon Tanner of the First Presidency stood at the pulpit and concluded the sustaining of the general authorities and general officers of the church by stating, now here's where I was nonchalant, maybe you were too, quote, at the meeting of the Council of the First Presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve held in the Salt Lake Temple on March 25, 1976, approval was given to add to the Pearl of Great Price the following two revelations. First, a vision of the celestial kid kingdom given to Joseph Smith the prophet in the Kirtman Temple on January 21, 1836 which deals with the salvation of those who die without a knowledge of the gospel. And second, a vision given to the Pro President Joseph F. Smith in Salt Lake City, Utah on October 3, 1918, showing the visit of the Lord Jesus Christ in the spirit world and setting forth the doctrine of the redemption of the dead. It is proposed that we sustain and prove this action and adopt these revelations as part of the standard works of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Because the congregation voted affirmatively, these two visions were immediately added to the Pearl of Great Price. In that action, the Pearl of Great Price received its first edition since its acceptance as a standard work in 1880. Five years later, those visions were transferred to the new 1981 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants of sections 137 and 138, where they are today. Church administration followed the pattern of canonization of Doctrine and Covenants 87 that had also been part of the Pearl Great Price before it was moved to the Doctrine and Covenants. In the text of section 138, no changes were made between the Pearl Great Price version and the version included. Both sections 137 and 138 shed light on the salvation of the dead, so their addition to scriptural canon was timely coming in the era of unprecedented temple building activity. Elder McConkie noted the timeliness of the canonization of section 138 with temple work. In the August 1976 Enzyme, he related, quote, it is significant that the two revelations which the brethren chose at this time to add to the canon of scripture, both deal with the great and wondrous concept known and understood only by the Latter-day Saints, the doctrine of salvation for the dead. With the dedication of the recent temples in Ogden, Provo, and Washington, D.C., with the complete remodeling of the Mesa St. George and Hawaii temples, and with building of new temples in Japan, Brazil, Mexico, and Seattle, this basic Christian doctrine, which shows the love of a gracious, gracious father for all his children, is receiving an emphasis never before known. As the vision became scripture, most Latter-day Saints little understood 
that it would promote temple and genealogical work as never before. It appears that one of the reasons the revelation had not been canonized before had to do with the inability of Latter-day Saints to do genealogical work with only limited technology before 1976. After revelation was accepted and binding on us, ways for us to fulfill our obligation to save the dead was outlined in the vision of the redemption of the dead were opened. General authorities began to use Section 138 on a more regular basis. In April of 1981, Elder Roy, Den De Roy Den G. Derrick of the 70 extensively reviewed what Joseph F. Smith saw in the spirit world. He quoted verses 11, 12, 14, 18, 20, 30 through 32, and 57 through 59. Never before had a general authority been so comprehensive in quoting verses from the vision. At the end of his talk, Elder Derrick very clearly outlined how the scripture had become binding, associating the scripture with finding names, building temples, and performing ordinances. He said, quote, One of the major missions of the church is to uniquely identify these individuals who have died and performed the necessary saving ordinances in their behalf, for they cannot do it for themselves. Once these ordinances are performed, if the individual accepts the gospel in the great world of spirits, then this work will be effective. The process of doing family history research in order to produce the needed data was being taught by general authorities. Other apostles have since talked of this responsibility, but have also suggested that joy would come from fulfilling the duty to serve for the dead. President Thomas S. Monson, then of the First Presidency in October 1992, instructed, quote, through our efforts in their behalf, their chains of bondage will fall from them, and the darkness surrounding them will clear away. That light may shine upon them, and they shall hear in the spirit world of the work that has been done for them by their children here, and will rejoice with you in your performance of these duties. Brothers and sisters, it was about this same time that I had the opportunity to do sealings in the temple. As I was sealing my great-grandmother, and my heart just went out to her. She lived to be 81 years old, and I found her in a workhouse. She had been a widow for more than 60 years. She had outlived all of her children. And I had the great opportunity to seal her to her husband that she'd been without mortality for so long. And the sealer said to me, don't you know that when you start to look for someone here, it's almost like a referral goes out there. And they now can be taught the gospel. Well, the general authorities were sharing that. Robert D. Hales of the Quorum of the Twelves restated the joy of the dead that they felt because their deliverance was at hand, intimating that Latter-day Saints would also feel joy in completing ordinances for the dead. I want you to know I felt that joy that day as I sealed my great-great-grandmother. In April of 1998, Elder M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve retold the magnificence of the vision by saying, quote, I do not believe anyone seeking light and knowledge can read from the revelation given to the prophet Joseph F. Smith in October of 1918 and not feel the spirit and power of revealed truth, end of quote. Of the eternal nature of man and his purpose in this great work of this church, Elder Ballard stated, how grateful we should be for the understanding that has come to us as a result of all the revelations that have been given to us in this last great dispensation. In April of 1993, President Ezra Taft Benson noted the timeliness of the vision of the redemption of the dead and its meaning to us as Latter-day Saints. He explained, quote, There has been considerable publicity and media coverage recently on the reporting of experiences that seemingly verify that life after life is a reality. In his address, President Benson used Joseph S. Smith's vision as the absolute declaration of life after life being a reality, reminding Latter-day Saints that the vision of the redemption of the dead had been accepted by the church as holy scripture. During the 21st century, Section 138 was often brought up in general conference. In the New Testament, it was recorded that Jesus had prophesied he would preach to the dead 
and general authorities disclosed that Joseph F. Smith's revelation showed that Jesus fulfilled that prophecy. In a discourse given in October 2000, Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve mentioned the vision and looked at it as a fulfillment of that prophecy. In 2004, General Young Women's President Elaine S. Dalton assessed more responsibility Latter-day Saints have because of the vision. In mentioning the vision of the redemption of the dead, she was very clear that the choice spirits that Joseph S. Smith saw were of our generation, that we are among those noble and great leaders prepared in the world of spirits to be on earth at this time. She suggested that Latter-day Saints received their first lessons in the world of spirits and were prepared to come forth in due time of the Lord to labor in his vineyard for the salvation of the souls of men. The labor these Latter-day Saints were prepared for and reserved to perform includes the building of the temples and the performances of ordinances therein for the redemption of the dead. Thus, Sister Dalton connected the vision to the binding responsibility on Latter-day Saints for temple work. In October of 2005, President Boyd K. Packer talked to the scriptures not being closed, using the coming forth of Section 138 as an example. During that same conference, Elder Paul E. Culliker of the First Quorum of the Seventy connected the vision with temple work, stating, quote, There is still available time in many temples to accommodate the Council of the First Presidency, to put aside some of our leisure time and devote more time to performing temple ordinances. I pray that we will be responsive to this invitation to come to the door of the temple. Not only was the vision in making Latter-day Saints aware of their responsibility to the dead, but it also began to be used as a tool in understanding other church doctrine. In May of 1982, Elder Joseph B. Wordland of the Quorum of the Twelve, along with President Henry B. Eyring of the First Presidency in October 2010, used the vision as a pattern for receiving revelation. They encouraged church members to take the same approach as President Joseph S. Smith in seeking revelation. Before introducing the vision, Elder Wordland began his address by saying, quote, It is about pondering, and what can be gained therefrom that I should like to address my remarks today? End of quote. Likewise, President Eyring used the vision as a metaphor. He said, For me, President Joseph S. Smith set an example of how pondering can invite light from God. General authorities also used the vision to emphasize the worth of women in his vision. Joseph F. Smith saw Eve and her daughters involved in missionary work in the spirit world. Elder Don H. Chokes of the Quorum of the Twelve in October 1993 emphasized Eve and her role, as did President Faust in 1999. President Faust validated Latter-day Saint women in their lasting legacy of blessing the lives of all men and women, both living and dead. In April 2007, during the refurbishing of the tabernacle, Bishop H. David Burton spoke about the things that had taken place in the structure. One of the things he mentioned was Joseph S. Smith's talk in October 1918. Said Bishop Burton, these old walls, if they could talk, would shout. We were here when President Joseph S. Smith rose from a prolonged illness to attend a session of general conference in October 1918. Though the Latter-day Saints in the tabernacle at the time of Joseph S. Smith's address must have wondered about the prophet's words. They could not have known the significance that future general authorities would place upon that vision, fulfilling the scripture. The great mercy of the Lord can be seen in the time of making the vision of the redemption of the dead binding upon Larry Saints. The Lord seemed to have waited until we would be available, until the means for us to do that would be more available. Through his leader, the Lord seemed to take preliminary steps in preparing us as Latter-day Saints for the inclusion of the vision of the redemption of the dead in the standard works. For instance, in November of 1974, while dedicating the Washington, D.C. Temple, President Spencer W. Kimball prophesied, the day is coming not too far ahead of us when all temples of this earth will be going night and day. In his October 1975 conference address, Elder Boyd K. Packer stated, that President Kimball's prophecy represented, quote, our signal 
that the great work necessary to sustain the temples must be moved forward, end of quote. He assessed. Genealogical work has, I fear, sometimes been made to appear too difficult, too involved, and too time-consuming to really be inviting to the average high priest. In the past, genealogy work has been slow, monotonous, and difficult. Latter-day Saints had been encouraged for decades to research their kindred dead and provide completed family group sheets that were verified by the Temple Index Bureau before the vicarious temple ordinances could be formed. This was slow. It was tedious. It was a hand-checking process, and often the information provided was incorrect and had to be rejected. An acute shortage of names had also plagued the Genealogical Society's effort to keep the temples supplied. Although Latter-day Saints were encouraged to do their own genealogy and not be dependent on temple files for names, the names available for temple work were often insufficient at the temples for those wanting to do temple work. With church membership increasing, the situation was critical, and solutions had to be found fast. Elder Packer and other members of the Temple and Geological Executive Committee were praying and studying to understand why the work wasn't going forward. And in these efforts, Elder Packer worked closely with Elder McConkey in exploring and discussing the scriptural base for such direction in which the committee was moving. Part of having the work go forward would include the canonization of those two revelations in the near future. By assignment, this is hilarious to me, by assignment from the First Presidency, Elder Packer addressed the employees of the Genealogical Society on November 18, 1975. This is what is hilarious. I'll get to in a minute. Now I'm appealing to you all to set your minds to the task of simplifying basic genealogical research and of streamlining in every way possible the process by which names come from members of the church and are ultimately presented in the temple ordinance for work. On December 10, 1975, the Genealogical Society became the Genealogical Department of the Church. This action made the department for the first time a fully integrated part of the church's central administration. In addition, during the first part of 1976, all general authorities visiting state conferences were instructed to tell Latter-day Saints to prepare a life history and to make a record of events which had transpired in their lives. With the preliminary measures listed that I just listed, they paved the way. The announcement of those two revelations to become scripture was significant in moving the work ahead. Immediately after the vision was canonized, major strides were made in simplifying genealogy. In 1976, the year the vision became scripture, the genealogical department adopted for the first time long-range goals. Before this implementation, long-range goal planning had been informal. The plan that was presented and cleared by the First Presidency include, included the creation of multiple automated data files and the widespread distribution of genealogical information through personal computers. The First Presidency envisioned that these goals would return the responsibility of finding names to the members with whom the responsibility had resided even from 1927. The goals anticipated the major accomplishments of the next two decades. Elder Richard G. Clark said the decision would revolutionize family history work. He hoped to make family history work easy and for anyone who would try. This would prevail, propel the church into a new era of family history activity. This is, I hope, the part that I thought was funny. Lucille Tate, Elder Packer's biographer, also come up, comments on the measures that were immediately taken after the vision became scripture <clears throat> to make family history work easier. In 1977, the Temple and Genealogy, Genealogy Executive Committee was chaired by Elder Howard W. Hunter and Elders Boyd K. Packer and Marvin J. Ashton and other members of the 70. By April 1st of that year, they had gained approval from the First Presidency for long-range goals that would move a church and a people nearer to what the Lord expected of them in redeeming their dead. The Genealogical Department was tooling up to enter the age of computers, and in order to become conversant, here's what I thought was funny, Elder Packer was sent to a one-week crash course at IBM in San Jose. <laughs> By assignment from the committee, Elder Packer, in a talk titled That They May Redeem Be Redeemed, after he'd been to IBM, said, Billions have lived, and we are to redeem all of them. Overwhelming? 
Not quite. He'd been to IBM. For we are the sons and daughters of God. He has told us that he would give no commandments unto the children of man, save he shall prepare a way for them that they may accomplish the thing which he commanded them. Up to that point of the vision becoming scripture, the way had not been secured for the majority of Latter-day Saints to perform the work. After the two visions became scripture, the way was open. In 1977, Elder Packer summed up the process as follows, quote, it is as though someone knew we would be traveling that way and we find provision. Inventions set along the way, waiting for us to take them up. And we see the invisible hand of the Almighty providing for us. In general conference, two years after canonization, President Kimball disclosed, I feel the same sense of urgency about temple work for the dead as I do about missionary work for the living, since they are basically one and the same. We are introducing a church-wide program of extracting names from geological records. In this same talk, President Kimball was clear that new technology had been made available to mankind. Why? To help us accomplish the Lord's purposes at a much faster pace with much greater accuracy than ever before. President Kimball continued, December 1978 marks the end of the current four generation programs for individuals and the beginning of a new four generation program for families. Now we come to a very significant idea associated with this thrust. This has been announced. Original research beyond the four generation level will be accepted, but will no longer be required of individual members of the church. Instead, the church feels the responsibility to begin a massive record gathering and extraction program in order to prepare names for temple work. By using computers, temples will be able to record their own information and rather than sending tons of paper back to Salt Lake, they will send a concise, computerized record of all their work. Consequently, our indexes will be made easier to compile. The computer would become the indispensable tool in geological research, allowing Latter-day Saints to fulfill their responsibility that Gen authorities had linked to Section 138. The key objective of the geological department was to streamline and simplify. simplify. Results of this streamlining and simplification were evident in a short time. Branch libraries were computerized in 1975, and by March 1976, film circulated number 22,000, which was a 45% increase. From March 1975, the Family History Library in Salt Lake was flooded with an average of 3,500 visitors a day during the summer of 1977. That was up from a high of 2,000 per day the previous year. In 1977, the stake record extraction program was introduced, and the program was, called, program was called phenomenally successful. In 1981, just five years after the vision was canonized, the Inter International Genealogical Index, or IGA, w was published. Members could now submit single entry forms with individual names with ha without having to wait until the individual could be linked to a family. The IGI grew substantially with each edition, expanding from 34 million names in 75, 81 million in 81, 108 million in 84, 147 million in 88, and 187 million in 92. That was an increase of 9 million names each year. The church news referred to the widespread interest as an international genealogical mania. The vision of the redemption of the dead has become central to the theology, theology of Latter-day Saints. It confirms and expands earlier prophetic insights concerning the work for the dead, and it introduces doctrinal truths that were unknown before October 1918 and were not fully instituted before 1976. As religious scholar Trevor R. Anderson describes, quote, Latter-day Saints view the words of the prophets and apostles as words of God and canonized scripture still stands on a higher plane. Canonization of a revelation or vision validates its authority, prominence, and doctrinal power. By being canonized, this 1918 vision was elevated from obscure church history to central core doctrine, end of quote. Since canonization, Doctrine and Covenants 138 has been linked by general authorities to temple, genealogy, and family history work. Section 138 is now a major part of the church doctrine, and Section 138's teachings 
on temple work has now become the basis of what church leadership teaches about the salvation of the dead. The process by which Joseph F. Smith's vision of the redemption of the dead becoming part of the Doctrine and Covenants serves, of an, serves as an example of how Revelation becomes canonized. Not until Latter-day Saints were capable of fulfilling their responsibility to the dead did the Revelation become binding. Over time, church leaders have taught about the significance of Section 138, and Latter-day Saints have lived by this doctrine in stages. Practices such as building temples and performing saving ordinances for the living and the dead demonstrate that the doctrines associated with the vision that were first considered authoritatively by the leadership of the church in 1918 are now binding. The remarkable process of bringing this vision to scripture is worthy of sharing with our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. Now that way has been made possible for the work of the salvation of the dead to be accomplished. This doctrinal foundation will yet provide the way, as Elder Boy K. Packer has expressed, for thousands of temples, and we can redeem our dead by thousands and by tens of thousands, and millions and billions and tens of billions, we have not yet moved to the edge of the light. End of quote. Brothers and sisters, it is my testimony that we live in a wonderful age, even the age of revelation that Joseph F. Smith's revelation on the redemption of the dead was true, that he was a prophet of God, just as we see, receive revelation now today from a wonderful prophet, even Thomas S. Monson. I'm so grateful to be in a church, to be in the gospel, where the Lord reveals and where we can then accomplish his great work upon the earth. And of this I bear testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I think I've got two minutes for questions. Why didn't my PowerPoint work? I don't know. Yeah. You know what? If you'll email me, I'll send it to you. I'm just mjw5 at byu.edu. Just my initials, then five. You bet. M J W five at BYU dot edu. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I don't think so because nobody talked about it for twenty years. So, you know, I, I that's what surprised me. Yes. Yes. I didn't I didn't quite hear the end of it. If I think you were saying in comparison to the revelation about all worthy males receiving the priesthood. The preparation, yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. I, I actually uh, did a study on that and looked at the preparation, especially with President Kimball. Absolutely, you see the same, same thing. Yeah. Uh, well, visions and um, doctrinal discourses. You know, the Wentworth letter, the lectures on faith, King Follett, there was also a discourse given in the Grove in 1844 by Prophet Joseph Smith that also was kind of along the lines of King Follett. And then the exposition by Joseph F. Smith on the Father and the Son in 1916. And those were not added. Well, that's, that's a good question. That's a good question. I, I think the two that they put in are really the, the lodestars of uh, work in the spirit world. And I think that's why they ended up there. 
you, you had other ones by Joseph F. Smith. There's a great one where he talks about, you know, what'll, what will men and women be doing in the spirit world? Well, men will be teaching men and women will be teaching women. And that was, that was a tiny little vision he had. But Vision of the Redemption of the Dead was so much more comprehensive that that's, that's the one they included. Yes? You know, it's uh, two, two interesting things. Maybe I could add to what she just said. And one, brothers and sisters, is it's interesting as Joseph S. Smith is listing who he sees in the spirit world, he misses somebody. You know who he misses? He misses Lorenzo. And I've always thought maybe when you die, you do get a little break for a little while. Maybe they'll put you right on a mission. I could be wrong, but... And the other thing I have believed, and this is just my opinion, but when I was kneeling there for my great-grandmother, the thought that came to me is, I think uh, missionary work is done by family there. And, and as the siller talked to me and said, you know, word went out, she could now be taught the gospel, the feeling I had is the person teaching my great-grandmother, it was such an incredible linking experience because I thought the person that taught my great-grandmother was my dad. So here I am, being sealed for her. My father taught her, and you know that long line to bring me into mortality. It's just, you know, when uh, when President Kimball said joy will come from it, I, I don't know any greater joy than when you have that opportunity. Well, I, I think I'm done. Oh. If you don't what? Wow. And things were destroyed. And so I, I have not felt this nearness, and I feel really bad um, about it. Um, and, and I don't know what to do. I, I think that's why we're going to have that thousand years. I hope so. Yeah, you're going to be busy. Yes? Yeah. Hey. hey, wonderful to be with you. Thank you so Thank much. You.